Good afternoon or uh, good morning to those who might be joining us from the West Coast. Uh, I want to welcome you to our webinar today on the topic of accountable health structures. Perhaps they're coming to a community near you. Um, those of you who have joined us today know that um, we have a few housekeeping rules. Oh, and there's my picture that you see every single month. I'm the director of the Healthcare Value Hub, and we're the ones bringing you the webinar. Um, we have just a few housekeeping uh, items before we get started. Thank you for joining us once again. Uh, audience members, your lines are muted until the question and answer period, but never fear. We always leave a lot of time for questions and answers, and you are welcome to type your pressing questions into the chat box um, if you can't wait until the Q&A. Today's webinar is being recorded, so those of us, those who could not join will be able to hear it later, and um, so keep that in mind if you ask your question verbally. And if you're having technical problems, perhaps you're hearing my voice but you're not able to log on to the webinar portion, please call Tad Lee at the number 202-776-5126. Hopefully no one is having any problems, and let's go ahead and get started. So um, I do have an announcement to make if, for those of you who perhaps signed up early for this webinar. Unfortunately, one of our two speakers had to drop out at the last minute. So you're going to be hearing more of my voice than you usually do as I make um, an effort to fill in with some of the information we were hoping she would present. But the good news is Greg Paulson from the Trenton Healthcare team is um, still with us, and uh, you're really going to enjoy his presentation, which will make everything that I'm saying real. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is a quote from a health affairs article that came out in January that we um, was very motivational to us. Uh, and this quote says, in case you're on the phone, improving the health and well-being of all Americans remains elusive, in part because the best efforts to reverse many of the worst trends, like rising health care costs, entrenched poverty, and social exclusion, have been narrow and disconnected. Narrow and disconnected should sound very familiar to anyone on the phone today who is thinking about how to transform our health system so it delivers better value and is more patient-centered. Um, the authors of this article, which I'm going to, you'll hear me quoting a couple times, uh, that would be Beth Siegel, Jane Erickson, Bobby Milstein, and Katie Evans Pritchard, go on to say, to address this problem, our failure to uh, improve, many stakeholders are attempting to strengthen connections across what have historically been fragmented health and social systems, and they're exploring comprehensive strategies that will not only reform how healthcare is delivered, but also build healthier and more equitable communities. So it, it's kind of like uh, Christmas in, for health reformers if they're able to accomplish this. Uh, we in addition to this article, we also uh, were in, encouraged to do this webinar because we felt there was a lot of confusion across terms that seemed to be referring to the type of um, approach that this article describes, this multi-stakeholder approach. You may have heard some of these terms, accountable health community, accountable community for health, accountable care community, accountable health structure, or perhaps multi-stakeholder collaboration. Uh, we have an issue brief coming out, I'll be telling you about it, where we attempt to do a taxonomy and make sense of these terms. But I will tell you that our bottom line is it's not that important to figure out what a given initiative, which approach a given initiative fits into. The most important thing is to embrace multi-stakeholder approaches where they make sense and follow best practices and look for doing that in more communities. So while it's a nice to have to understand these terms, it is not the most important thing that we need to do today. So let's get specific. Um, you're going to hear, I had to pick a term to use, and you're going to hear me talk in terms of accountable health structures as an overarching term, because um, I like keeping the word accountable in there. But uh, Multi-stakeholder collaboration is also quite specific. I may slip into that term, so I apologize for still using two terms. Uh, 
So what is an accountable health structure? Simply put, it's a community-based approach to achieving population health. And what's exciting for us is that sometimes these initiatives are pursuing additional goals like a health equity goal or maybe a health system efficiency goal. Uh, I'm going to give you my last quote from the Health Affairs article. Um, another way to think about these efforts is that they are place-based reform efforts collaboratively led by stakeholders spanning public health, health care, and other sectors such as education, housing, transit, and social services. So we're going to be giving you some examples of how these other stakeholders can be brought in. Um, Another way that we think about these things is that they're really building on an overall movement designed to provide integrated health care. Um, if you were on a webinar of ours from several years ago, we talked about patient-centered medical homes, um, and this is where we try to integrate the delivery of primary care, and they're becoming quite common all around the country. Um, an accountable care organization, which can be confusing because it also has the word accountable in there, builds upon the integration in a patient-centered medical home by bringing in hospital systems and trying to integrate care across this broader array of clinical services. You've also heard us here at the Hub talk about social medical models or partnerships. This is getting close to the accountable health structure. Now we're not only um, integrating across our hospital and uh, clinical settings, but we're also trying to take uh, provide connected community resources for our most complex patients. Uh, these models, while they're very similar to uh, my final shape here, accountable health structures, I, in our mind, they're just a little bit narrower. They may be connecting patients to um, housing services and so on, but they might not yet be bringing in things like um, economic development corporations or employers or schools or the park service. So um, it's a gray area in here and it's, that's not important. We're just trying to help people get a handle on what we're talking about today. Um, integration is good. So within these models, uh, there is quite a bit of variation. They vary by funding source. So we're going to have a, show you a taxonomy that talks about that. They may vary by w the population being served, by the stakeholders that are coming in to participate, and by the overall focus and goals. So let's look at this taxonomy. Um, we realize that that may be a bit of a fine print for some folks listening today. It's going to be available on our website. And you'll see we've tried to make sense of some of the terms I put up initially. We're using an overall term, accountable health structure, and within that we differentiate between accountable communities for health and accountable care communities. And again, these distinctions aren't important, but as you encounter these terms, we're just trying to be helpful. An accountable care community may um, typically has a broad source of funding. It likely involves all the residents in an area, not a subset of the population. It may be organized by the local public health agency. I'll be uh, showing you an example of that. And they often involve a really broad array of stakeholders and a pretty broad array of goals. In contrast, um, there's a number of efforts, there's various types of funding from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS, that also support these types of models. But in some cases, they need to be focused on certain beneficiaries, like accountable health communities, um, a column over on the left, is focused on Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. After that, they might have as their backbone organization, that's the entity that keeps everybody organized. Um, it could take Take, that could be a number of entities. It could be a health plan, a health system, or a nonprofit organization. Um, and they may or may not involve a slightly smaller range of partners in their efforts. Uh, DISRIP waivers focus on Medicaid beneficiaries, but that's also a source of funding that can be used for extremely similar uh, models. And SIM grants have been widely used in a variety of creative ways. That's um, uh, innovation uh, I forget what the S is. It's Innovation Model Grants. I know the folks on the phone know. And uh, those can be broader. They can focus on a wider range of residents. Um, they might typically be organized around a nonprofit organization, although that's not required. And they might begin to um, expand the partners that are involved. So we hope that this taxonomy will be helpful to folks. List oh, <laughs> thank you, Andy. State innovation models. As someone who does uh, a lot of work in states, it's amazing that I couldn't remember the S word. So 
Um, let's, Lynn's going to clean up her act now. Uh, this taxonomy, we consider it to be a leave, um, living document that's here to help you, and we welcome improvements to it as you try to work with it. So let's look at a couple of examples. Our first example is Live Well San Diego. If you have not yet heard of this um, accountable health structure or accountable care community, uh, we hope that you look into it very soon. This is a really ambitious effort. They're trying to serve all the residents of San Diego County, and as officials there told me uh, right off the get-go, they're bigger than the state of Connecticut. So apologies to the state of Connecticut, but it's ambitious. It's organized, um, the backbone is San Diego Health Department which in our discussions with them re reveals a lot of advantages in terms of getting stakeholders organized. They, um, because they are serving a very large geographic area, the focus areas are actually determined at the sub-county level. They've organized themselves into region. They've used a community engagement process to surface what residents want to work on, and uh, they've just in They've got uh, impressive infrastructure um, and an impressive range of activities going on. A few of the ones that we are aware of include, um, hmm, sorry, I've, I've lost my list for San Diego, so we'll have to come back. But some ones that I remember are, um, for example, they have a child obesity efforts that involves working with employers and schools and communities to do fun runs and, you know, talk about healthy food. Um, they've done, um, I think there was a, well, I won't speculate. I'll get my list and come back to it. I seem to have moved it off my desk. Oh, wait, and here it is. Apologies. Um, they have, um, they, work, they do a lot of systems navigation. They use social workers paired with peer support um, specialists. They do tenancy report, helping people to become housing ready, and a number of other things. Uh, let's go on and look at the next one, the North Sound Accountable Community of Health. This is based in the state of Washington. It's actually won some awards. They're serving the Medicaid beneficiary population. Uh, their backbone organization is – their Backbone is a nonprofit organization, and actually the state had a specific uh, pathway that they wanted these models to follow, whereby even if they started being uh, centered, uh, maybe organized by a health system or a hospital or a health plan, they had to move on to have an independent agency or nonprofit organization to service the backbone. They're working in a wide variety of areas and embracing a wide variety of stakeholders. Um, in addition to these broad focus areas of delivery system transformation, addressing workforce shortages, I know they have a dental therapist um, effort to improve access to dental care. They're trying to improve population health. Um, they're working on primary care integration. They're trying to address opioids, improving care coordination, and I believe they're launching um, a new effort to help prevent unintended pregnancies. So lots of activity there working across these stakeholders. This is my final example. The Greater Detroit Area Health Council is uh, unique in several ways. They're based in Michigan. Uh, they serve the residents of southeastern Michigan. They've actually been around for a very long time. They're one of the oldest. Um, in fact, I think they are the oldest. They started in 1944 acting as a convener that looked um, that embrace cross-sector initiatives right from the get-go. Some things they're working on now are um, among their members are putting healthy infrastructure in place, like um, improving parks, putting in bike paths. They have a diabetes prevention effort, um, trying to get healthier food into corner stores and things like that. They're trying to address disparities. So I won't go on and on, but these are just a few examples of these types of efforts, which I think are so promising. And with that, let's talk about what we know about these efforts. Um, again, uh, channeling the few articles, uh, we'll be having a resources page at the end of this webinar where we will put these articles up. These, there are, um, the stat, status of the evidence is mixed. I think many, many people think these models are extremely promising, and obviously there's a lot of funding streams to support them. There have actually been very few rigorous studies designed to assess the impact, and in fact, within many of the initiatives, they don't, they don't yet have a great system for measuring impact. Um, they may 
and they, especially that longer term impact that is often how these models are expected to work. Um, the health affairs articles that I, uh, authors that I cited earlier characterize most current models as not very mature. And um, their, the orientation of this article was that they need to mature. They need to become, for example, right now they might not take risks. Um, they might not want to offend any stakeholders involved. And eventually the backbone organization, according to these authors, may need to get uh, better at resolving conflicts within the stakeholders and being willing to take risks and, you know, move beyond where areas where there is only complete uh, consensus. Um, some stakeholders are not yet heavily involved in many of them. Some of them, it's true, for example, health plans were noted as a stakeholder that is involved in some initiatives, but maybe not enough. Economic development organizations were another stakeholder that were mentioned in the same capacity. Uh, here at the Healthcare Value Hub, we're very interested in whether or not these models can be used to pursue efficiency goals. Um, not only a public health goal like chronic disease prevention, which is extremely common uh, across these models, but can we use them to transform the delivery system? Can we use this approach to reduce uh, the provision of low-value care, to improve the provision of high-value care, to do a better job of aligning healthcare resources where the population to the population that needs them, and other types of goals. Um, we do think there's some, uh, there's a lot of promise in working at the local or regional level. You can be more tailored to what's going on in your community. In the few examples that I already provided, you can see that in some cases, efficiency goals are being pursued, but we'd like to, we're very interested going forward in exploring how this could perhaps become more common. And finally, um, it's very common that uh, the or organizational infrastructure might not be fully developed and they may be struggling as far as funding goes. A lot of the funding sources I mentioned earlier are very good for startup funding, but it's hard to uh, create sustained funding. And in my in that regard, uh, the Greater Detroit model is interesting because it's a membership model. I'll in fact, I'll put it back up for a second. Um, it's a membership model where the stakeholders pay in uh, in order to sustain the backbone organization and keep these um, cross-sector initiatives alive and working. So something to be considered. With that, that's the end of me trying to channel our missing speaker. And I would like to invite Greg to um, unmute and tell us about his model in Trenton. Uh, thank you, Lynn, and uh, really appreciate the invitation. And uh, hello to all of you for uh, joining on this Friday, which in New Jersey is actually a pretty nice Friday today. Uh, so my name is Greg Paulson. I'm the uh, executive director of an organization named Trenton Health Team. A little bit my personal background, uh, my entry into healthcare um, after I came to my senses of not deciding to go to medical school, which was kind of in the cards for a while for me. I ended up uh, having my initial clinical exposure in pre-hospital emergency medical services and uh, began to work for hospitals here in New Jersey where our paramedic service is hospital-based. So that was my window into individual institutions as well as working across healthcare institutions and, and kind of silos within those institutions. Uh, I've been here at Trenton Health Team for um, about five years and uh, of note came on as the second employee at the time. So we've had a, a good bit of growth during that period. So what I was uh, hoping to talk about with everyone today is kind of our journey. I think the um, the, the conversations at the Healthcare Value Hub and even so far on this webinar today are, are really important. And from our view, I hope that I can add some local context and by giving you some context about the work here in Trenton, uh, perhaps uh, give some additional light onto these overall concepts. So I'm going to just briefly talk to you about how we got started and, and where we've been trying to go and then maybe where we think we're headed in the future. So uh, the genesis that start to bring us together, well, maybe let me start with a little bit about Trenton for those who aren't familiar. Trenton is the capital of New Jersey. Um, it's a relatively small community of about 85,000 people. Um, most would think of Newark or Camden, perhaps, when you first think of New Jersey. Um, 
our geography includes a little bit of a larger area when it comes to our Medicaid ACO demonstration, which is a geographic um, attributed model in New Jersey, and we have about 110,000 people living in that area, about 50,000 of which are on Medicaid. You see some demographic data, some overall poverty data, violence and disease prevalence. So, you know, as in many communities, this is an urban center that has had a strong industrial past, certainly a very proud history before that, back to the Revolutionary War, um, but has had a lot of socioeconomic challenges in the meantime. And what kind of got us all started is one of the two acute care hospitals in the city announced plans, one of the two acute care hospital systems announced plans to close one of their facilities. So there were two acute care hospitals run by Capital Health and one hospital run by St. Francis. And Capital Health announced plans to close a hospital in order to build a new campus uh, in a suburban community nearby. And going through the, the certificate of need for closure process, the mayor of Trenton was asked what he thought the health impact would be on the community. He said, well, I don't quite know, uh, and brought in a consultant who convened the kind of the major players in the healthcare delivery system to work on what the community impact would be. So those founding partners you see on the right side, the two hospital systems at the top, Henry J. Austin Health Center is our federally qualified health center. It's the only one in our community. And then the fourth partner was the city of Trenton and specifically the public health department. So while we are not a public health entity, we've had public health as part of our story from the beginning. And what started as an executive working group of fiercely competitive institutions uh, began to see alignment of priority, alignment of challenges, and decided that it was in their collective interests to keep working together. Uh, there was some effective carrot and stick encouragement from our state health department, um, but by 2010, the group was working together so much and seeing each other weekly, they decided to form uh, 501c3, and we hired our first executive director in 2011. We were organized around five strategic initiatives, uh, expanding access to primary care, which was one of the findings of that original consultant report, uh, doing community-wide cross-institution care coordination and care management, working to engage the, clinic, the community, specifically the non-clinical community, in their health, uh, to better utilize data to improve the health of the population, and to be ready to apply for New Jersey's Medicaid ACO demonstration project, which was being conceived uh, in the legislature at that time. Uh, if you're familiar with Dr. Brenner in Camden and his hotspotting work, and that was a lot of the, the local implementation here in New Jersey of a lot of those concepts. And what we've done in some of these acronyms aren't, aren't quite important, uh, but these are a lot of the programs that we implemented over our initial, um, initial work to meet those uh, those five initiatives. So for the expanding access to care, we worked with Dr. Mark Murray and did an advanced access scheduling project and interestingly did it across all our clinical sites. So it wasn't just that the FQHC did it or one hospital did it, but the entire community did it together. Um, we facilitated some partnership among the FQHC and the hospital such that the hospital actually turned over their family medicine program to the FQHC to allow them to run it, so to create more access. That C4T you see there, kind of in the, the teal color, is our community-wide clinical care coordination team. Of course, we're in healthcare, so we love acronyms. What that really was was the, the providers and social workers and all the staff from the emergency departments coming together and saying, you know, we think we're seeing the same people. Let's put the lists together and see if that really is the case. And they, they came to the first meeting, each with their lists of the top 50 ER high utilizers, and lo and behold, there was, in fact, a significant amount of overlap. So they began to discuss what's our plan for each of these individuals and how can we go back and execute that. In the yellow was a lot of our community-based programming. So we have an active community advisory board. In 2012, we did a unified community health needs assessment process rather than each hospital doing one separately, which they had done in before. Uh, we've worked with some Novo Nordisk funding, some Trinity Health System funding on healthy activities, obesity prevention, food access, a lot of trauma-informed care work that Robert Wood Johnson supported. Um, and you know, moving farther down into the data, we operate the health information exchange that covers the entire region, which we are getting better and better at leveraging to do population analysis and segmentation, and then, of course, participation in the, the um, Medicaid ACO demonstration project. So I mentioned that first group coming together around uh, ER high utilizers, and we had a lot of success. So you see that first group of all of the providers coming together, and without any additional staff, they were simply able to better align efforts and look at the top 50 and have a lot of successes. One of the highest uh, utilizers, her name was Lady B, had 465 ER visits in the 12 months prior to that group coming together, which, yes, is more than one a day, which did not show up before the institutions came together and, and combined their data or 
put their lists in the same place, I guess is more appropriate, uh, because she would go from one institution to another. And uh, after our intervention with Lady B in the subsequent year, she had 12 ER visits and only one inpatient stay. She was homeless and had substance abuse problems and many of the things that you would expect uh, would be driving that kind of utilization. The gentleman on the right is also interesting. His name is Clifton, and the lady he's standing next to is a nurse practitioner from St. Francis named Peg Nacero. Uh, Clifton, you see his uh, utilization patterns there. He had avoidable utilization both in the emergency department and in inpatient stays. Uh, Clifton has end-stage renal disease and needed hemodialysis, and Clifton's trouble was that he would come in for dialysis and be unable to sit there long enough to complete treatment. He was very anxious. He actually was later diagnosed with anxiety disorder, and no matter what the dialysis staff tried, they just couldn't get him to, to sit still. They tried you know, giving him some music and showing him movies. And when Peg started working with him, she finally said to him one day, Clifton, what do you like to do? And Clifton said, well, I'd like to draw. So she had brought him in some colored pencils and paper, and he began to draw, and all of a sudden his dialysis was completed. Um, and so interestingly, uh, that painting that you see was actually commissioned of Clinton by one of the private foundations we work with, and it now hangs in our boardroom as a reminder of the importance of simply meeting a patient where she or he is and asking them, uh, you know, what do you need and, and working on that way. I see a question from Andy about how did we manage HIPAA confidentiality requirements, and we actually executed uh, data sharing agreements among all of the partners. And then the individuals in the room were uh, all involved in care, so we managed minimum necessary by having a smaller group review the lists to look for the overlap, and then the patients discussed were the ones that specifically had overlap and therefore a treatment relationship with uh, people in both institutions. Interestingly, it's the same kind of structure and same kind of legal agreements that we later executed to build the health information exchange. So one of the things that we, we talk about in the technology piece is technology is simply allowing us to move information more efficiently and more quickly, it doesn't actually change the original principle. And so that those first comparing of lists we view as kind of a precursor of how our, our HIE works. So you see some results there on the bottom. And we were feeling pretty successful with that. We actually, after that, built a, a community uh, community-based care management team that's led by community health workers that are seeing patients in their homes weekly. They carry a very small panel size of 25 apiece, and it's designed to expand on that work and do more work with the high utilizers. So we've been around for a little over 10 years, uh, and we've got an organization of 18 people and have active partnerships with more than 60, 60 community organizations. We've gotten about $15 million in funding cumulatively. Our annual budget now is around $3 million. Um, so we feel like we've done a good bit of work. You know, certainly we're in a, a complex healthcare landscape. We've had a lot of multi-year grants um, that are helping because it's not a kind of one-off for one year, but we are still about 65% grant funded. And so what we're starting to talk about now, though, is this really this picture on the right. We can do a tremendous amount of care management and care coordination but the map on the right is showing you life expectancy uh, with an RWJF-funded uh, project. And in the lower left is Trenton, where you see that dark red 73. And 15 minutes up State Highway 1 in the Princeton area, you have a 14-year longer life expectancy. And all of the care management efforts in the world aren't going to change that. So we've been asking ourselves more and more, how do we – move our efforts from this kind of responsive meeting of the urgent needs within our community to actually transform the system to start consider some of the things that are going to have an impact on utilization, on outcomes, on cost, on patient experience down the road. And so as part of that, we've been participating in the Rethink Health Ventures project um, led by the uh, Re Rethink Health, funded largely by the Ripple Foundation and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So if you haven't checked them out, their uh, website's there on the lower right. And this, mo this uh, slide here is actually part of their model and understanding how might we come together as a community to engage in regional health transformation. The, uh, the article that Lynn was referencing earlier from Health Affairs was actually written by a lot of the, uh, the project directors and faculty from the Rethink Health Project. What you see is the process by which a community might start to come together in, or in and around a backbone organization. And then the, the left-hand side where you see campaigning is, is when you know, people have a you know, the common purpose, they have a project they want to work on together, and you're beginning to bring some stakeholders together. And the green lines are intended to represent how progress might happen. You have uh, you know, an improvement in uh, effectiveness of the health system. You're going to have some pitfalls that kind of get you off track, but you've got this kind of bumping process where you go up 
a little bit, up a little bit. And as you start to go farther along in phase two where you're maybe working with some people now a little bit more deeply, phase three where you're starting to align around more common objectives, there's a point somewhere in the middle which is represented by that dotted line box and that shift from light gray to dark gray where you notice the green line jumps up. And what that represents to us is the process of moving from improving the system around the edges to really transforming how the system works together. And in order to get to that system transformation, we have to have a way to start iterating on what some new design models might be. And once we find things that work, how do we scale them and how do we integrate them into the system overall? So there's the uh, link down there on the bottom. Feel free to peruse their site. There are a lot of other uh, tools and things that have been incredibly useful for us as we've been going through this journey over the last about year and a half to examine how we might do this together. Um, so part of, part of what we need to do in order to design the system is have a way to talk about where do we want to be at the end of that redesign? What is our vision for the future? And I don't think our vision, if we would articulate, you know, what, how do we envision Trenton in 10 or 15 or 20 years, we don't talk about doing a lot more care management of high utilizers. So one of the things we've done in this process is talk about where do we want to be in the future. And what you see here is uh, actually an output from a series of retreats that we've done with our organization board, our community advisory board, and our staff. Uh, and you see one of the uh, kind of the post-it sessions on, uh, on the right there. But w how do we see Trenton of the future? And I think it's important to note that, you know, certainly quality, integrated, accessible, people-centered people -centered healthcare is a huge part of this vision, but it's nowhere near the entire vision. In fact, it's not even the first thing we talk about when we envision a community of the future. So if this is where we're trying to get, I think we need to do things in a different way. And as we talk about these accountable health structures, one of the things that's challenging even looking at that taxonomy is these are kind of categorized by how they're funded especially in different parts of the healthcare delivery system. There's a lot here that I don't think we envision or even intend to be part of the funding of the healthcare delivery system, and yet it's such a driver of our uh, increased costs and decreased uh, quality of outcomes. So how do we knit this together, and how do we have the right people and the right strategies around the table to set out and achieve a shared vision? For us, part of that transition has been talking about not just improving health, but improving health and well-being, and looking at the vital conditions of the community for how we can do that. And certainly there's a challenge here, uh, and I think this is something Lynn talked about earlier, of measuring impact versus the time horizon. If we're talking about improving the economy or improving education outcomes, these are not things that are going to generate an impact within the time horizon that is often dictated based on our funding sources. So there's a challenge there that we don't yet have a resolution for, but I think it's part of what that Health Affairs article spoke about of, of we need to get to a different place in terms of how these multi-stakeholder collaboratives can work together. So we uh, strive to serve as a backbone organization that is a neutral convener that can both catalyze system change and implement those changes across partners. Uh, and those key backbone functions we think are pretty important, that we want to help the separate entities be able to see themselves in a bigger system. Uh, before engaging in the Rethink Health Project, we really had trouble seeing just how big the system was and have an awareness of what others in the system are doing or how those might be impacted by our programs and our actions or the concept of intended versus unintended consequences. We want to help the community at large, not just our organization, but the community at large more balance its focus on interventions that address vital conditions on over a long time horizon while still doing the work that we need to do to, to meet the urgent needs in the community. We're certainly not going to stop doing that. Uh, we want to increase awareness and coordination and help organizations better leverage the resources that they already have access to. You know, but part of asking for more resources for us needs also to be making best use of all of the available resources that are here in the community. And part of that is, is in making sure that we have a degree of transparency and, and fairness among stakeholders. Interestingly, uh, you know, we were talking about this managing conflicts within stakeholders. We had a meeting, uh, I think it was actually Monday this week, of a bunch of different entities that were pursuing a new state grant that was just released around uh, improving uh, pregnancy outcomes and, and black infant mortality. And it was interesting that you know, we, this is probably for us the fourth or fifth time we've seen a request for proposals come out, heard a lot of buzz in the community, a lot of organizations that were thinking about applying. We said, well, you know, let's just put everybody in the same room. So we we did bring about 18 different people together and came into room and kind of as it was when Trenton Health Team got started, we needed to make a space where we acknowledge that there are competitors in the room. 
and that each organization is coming to the table with their own priorities and their own ideas, some of which they can share and some of which they would not want to share. So our, our stated goal for the meeting was first transparency, to let everyone see what everyone else was, was intending and best case, find opportunities for collaboration such that maybe one entity that was thinking about applying sees someone else in the room or hears an idea in the room that they feel stronger and therefore decides not to pursue that grant. And uh, in each of those, we've, we've seen the number of applications ultimately coming out for a particular program decrease from the beginning, and we've seen a tremendous increase in partnerships. So creating an environment where uh, there is a degree of transparency and kind of sets the stage for better collaboration is one of the things we're trying to understand how we do better. But all of that is based on it being okay for competitors to be around the table and um, not feel bad about needing to compete with other organizations in the room. A lot of the funding for this work to date has come from non-healthcare sources. Um, certainly there's been a tremendous amount of funding from philanthropy, uh, certainly healthcare-related philanthropy, the Merck Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Trinity Health System. Um, we're also part of the Build Health Challenge. Uh, the, the work by National Quality Forum and AHRQ and America's Essential Hospitals was really kind of similar to the work I think that the Healthcare Value Hub is doing, is trying to bring people together who are working on this so that we can have a forum to share ideas is, um, I wouldn't say share successes, I'd more say share failures and learn from those so that we can try to advance the field faster together. Uh, we certainly don't feel that we are experts by any means, and I think that's probably a common feeling of many on this call, that you know we haven't figured it out yet, but we're all going to figure it out faster together if we can learn from each other and if we can have a way to better communicate uh, as we go forward. So that's most of the presentation I have for you today. Uh, I would very much like to keep in touch with all of you, and you can certainly learn more about us from the, the ways you see here. Um, but I look forward to some questions, uh, and uh, Lynn, I'll turn it back to you. All right. That is excellent. Um, oh, shoot. Well, my computer seems to have gone to sleep. Um, so as a reminder, the folks listening on the line right now are muted, and you can hit star six to unmute. And you are welcome to ask a question verbally, or you can type it into the chat. And um, I'll give a, a pause here to see if we have questions. Otherwise, I'll ask Gary a question. OK. Well, um, yo, is there a question? Oops. There we go. Start, so you can remember to hit star six. OK, Greg. Um, so I think there was quite a bit of interest in um, how you integrated data to um, first help your high utilizers, how you address HIPAA considerations. As you think about your big grand vision, is there, is, is, does that data integration role continue? Uh, so we're actually, our med I med mentioned the Medicaid ACO demonstration project. It's actually about to sunset, and we're now kind of articulating what's the next version of that, so kind of a new accountable health structure. Um, and one of the key pillars of that is facility with kind of broad population level data. So I think it's incredibly important. Um, and a couple thoughts there. So our health information exchange has data from all the acute care hospitals, a lot of primary care, subacute, lab providers. I mean, it's pretty comprehensive in clinical data. We've also brought in claims data from Medicaid and other sources there. So we provide an analytics service that's powered both by claims and clinical data. The next step for us as we're starting to work, for example, with the school system on chronic absenteeism is to find where might chronic absenteeism absenteeism be caused by repeated, for example, asthma exacerbation, which might actually have an environmental cause. So how do we get student absenteeism data into the same environment so that we can, I mean, these are, these are all person-centered data points. So if we can certainly protect privacy and security, but bring them together and bridge across these silos, it gives us a way to actually start tangibly working upstream and addressing, for example, the mold in a household that's causing the asthma, that's causing the child to not be in school. Um, but that is uh, the other thing I'd add to that is just having the data together is not sufficient. Um, mm -hmm. We're also kind of, I think, understanding how important the importance of perspective in working with the data. So our internal data team here, and that team is two people. Um, 
has a different way that they view questions than, for example, our counterparts in the FQHC or in the hospital. So working with kind of messy, multi-sector population health data sets is a unique thing to do that has its own uh, considerations and challenges. And I think having the people to work with the data is, uh, is equally important. Um, I saw Russell's question, are there any large or key community partners that have refused to join our group and collaborate? I don't know that there's been any overt refusal. I think what we've had to be sensitive to in the beginning was that there was a feeling that perhaps um, we were a little too ambitious or you know, kind of stepped on people's toes. Uh, one of the things that kind of initially empowered us in the community is that healthcare created us. So we were the connection to the major players in the healthcare delivery system. But I think we had to learn uh, to avoid some of the scope creep and be more sensitive to our mission. Um, and now we're, we're at the point where uh, we had our community advisory board retreat a few weeks ago, and one of the partners said to us, you know, what we're doing is kind of changing the framework here. Uh, we're actually even renaming the group because community advisory board suggests that it exists to advise us on how we should do things. The model we're actually trying to move to is how do we as the backbone help our partners do things that support health. Now that being said, there are still some other organizations that kind of want to have their own backbone role and uh, you know, still feel some competitive tendency in that way, but we we design our interactions such that we can support a continuum of engagement. So if they choose to come to the table, that's great. If not, the, the door is never closed. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing thing, and it's frankly, as, as anywhere, uh, one that's largely based on relationships and, and understanding what the competitive tendencies are and what is the potential value we can bring to those partners. So no hour refusals, um, but continuing to get more and deeper engagement uh, is, is ongoing work for us. Uh, uh, building on Russell's question, if if you're in a community that doesn't yet have an organization like this, uh, somebody could be listening on the webinar today, and maybe they try to get something going. But is there, if there's a bit of a crisis, like you mentioned, the fact that this, um, you know, the, this hospital was going to close, and we had to decide how to meet the needs of the community. Um, do you have any advice for leveraging um, kind of a, a, a catalyst event? Uh, sure. If, if people are really interested no, in getting that, Yeah, go. Yeah, that fits into that kind of pathway model, right? That's that first phase of, of coming together around a particular campaign or response to a, you know, a burning platform. Um, and it's very useful to bring people together because I think it gives a clear purpose. And so the challenge is after you move away from that initial call to action, how do you maintain that clear purpose and maintain value for all stakeholders? So in order for that collaboration to work, everyone has to derive value, support for their own work in coming together. And what that might be around I think is very different for, for each community. But there has to be a value proposition to making the, 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 the uh, work continue to happen collaboratively. We've also not found a way to rush it yet. Um, there are other communities in New Jersey that are seeking to do the same thing and have had a lot of success, but these things take time and they're slowed down by unique challenges in each community. Certainly there are themes about other, you know, other priorities or financial considerations or staffing or lack of the infrastructure or, you know, kind of the, the you want to be around a table, well, whose table is it? And you know, <laughs> If someone owns the table, who's one of the people trying to come around it, that makes it hard. Um, so it does take some time, and especially in the early phases, it's very dependent on people wanting to make it happen and getting the right people who can see that there's, there's potential in the future and it's worth trying again when you stumble and have one of those pitfalls. So, and are there resources, let's say you have a stakeholder or two in a community that thinks this is a good idea, are there resources to help them or does everybody kind of have to figure it out for themselves? I think, you know, this, yeah, like sure. learning to I mean, collaborate, learning to avoid pitfalls, learning to avoid scope creep, all the things you're talking about today. Boy, I think there are probably more resources than we know what to do with. Um, okay. My, my first thought in thinking to answer that question, though, is why is someone trying to come around the table, and do we want to ask them 
to learn the resources, or is there someone else who can help support them? You know, they have something that they want to work on, and you know, we can share a little bit. But I, I think people often need some handholding in the beginning to you know have the right facilitated discussions and you know have the right uh, environment to come around the table more. Um, I think that the Rethink Health Project is a great place to start. They they do the pulse check across a bunch of organizations, kind of seeing what the trends are, which is actually some of the data that powered that Health Affairs article. They've got a, uh, a simulation tool that helps communities come together and explore um, impact of interventions over time. Uh, which is another really useful thing where everyone will derive value. You know, you're, you're, you're planning to do care management or pursue a value-based thing or, you know, invest in this particular aspect of the community. Well, let's think about what the impact of that's going to be over five or 10 or 25 years and try to model it together and then have a discussion about how do we adjust our intervention based on what our projections would be about 25 years. Will we still be achieving what we want to beyond a one or a two or three year time horizon? I think where a lot of the conversations start is, you know, I need to reduce my readmissions by this time next year in order to get this bonus payment. And that's important, we need to do that. But when we're having the next kind of conversation about really what's the problem I'm trying to impact on a three or five year time horizon, that can be, the, the exercise of working through that together can be a strong convening force. Okay. Um, I want to pause for a moment. Is there anybody on the phone who wants to hit star six, unmute, and ask a question? Okay. Interrupt if you do, because I've got another one for Greg. So let's say you're at the other end of the pathway. Um, you're really moving along, but you need funding. Uh, you know, you, you cobble together some funding to get started. I know that there are many people out there who are really kind of interested in doing a capture of the savings down the road, um, the savings that might be estimated by the sim simulation models that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is that what are what is your group thinking about along these lines? Like how to build this, how, how to sustain yourself, perhaps using the savings that you're generating for your region. So a couple answers to that. The first is that we don't, in the near term, see us um, kind of shedding grant funding. Uh, but one of the things we are doing more is while we are not directly um, in, we're not directly sharing risk ourselves, we're partnering with organizations who are. So we have contracts with managed care organizations and hospitals who purchase some services from us and are relying on those services to help them achieve value and help them achieve savings payments, uh, whether that's data services or our community health workers who are you know, in the community, of the community, in the home. So that's the first step for us. We do see in the future moving more toward pursuing those ourselves, um, but I think the next step for that is how do you fund the backbone function itself? Because that ability to pursue shared saving programs together requires, in our mind, that, that backbone function, which it's hard to fund with, you know, a 10% fringe or a 10% indirect rate on a bunch of different things. So certainly the, the services that we provide uh, at a cost to our partners help with that. But some of this is, is almost a, a state function. So whether it's part of MCO work or whether it's actually part of governmental funding or membership payments or things like that, um, I, I think – the more we rely on this infrastructure, this neutral infrastructure, um, the more effective it can be if it's actually paid for. Yeah, well, it's as you said at the beginning, we're still all figuring this out. And I think I and everyone on the phone today are really grateful that organizations um, such as yours are out there, out front, trying to figure this out. Um, so can I um? I just saw Rachel's comment, the um, question earlier. I apologize that I had missed that around behavioral health IT, and uh, that that triggered two thoughts for me. One was some of our early work in the HIE world was actually to stop the over identification of health information as sensitive. So something like an ER visit that talks about behavioral health conditions and substance abuse. Uh, our initial conversations where people didn't want to share that because they felt it was behavioral health IT. So getting people to not over-apply regulations. Where we are now is, for example, doing integrated care work with our FQHC where they do uh, medication-assisted treatment is integrated with their primary care visits, and that's great. And now all of a sudden we have regular old primary care visits 
that are now funded by Part 2 and may be subject to additional disclosure requirements. So two fascinating things about uh, behavioral health and kind of regular physical health IT. One is, you know, don't apply behavioral health standard when you don't have to, but now the better we get at integrating, <laughs> the more we have problems with Part 2. Yeah, it, it's definitely a tricky landscape, and um, as you're probably well aware, the advocacy community wants to have all the uh, successes while being very strict with respect to patient confidentiality. So you know, it's, it's a fine line that you have to walk there. So um, if uh, I want to put out a final request to see if there are any more questions. Um, so I'll pause. Any questions, uh, star six to unmute or type your question in the chat box. Otherwise, we're going to wrap up today's webinar. Short pause here. Okay. So um, as a reminder, uh, we did create some resources for you. Um, there's a new research brief that actually won't be up until Monday, uh, the taxonomy that you just saw, and that's all available, along with um, the Health Affairs article and other links that we think will be useful to you. They're available on our website at this link that you see before you. Um, a recording of the webinar will also be available. And with that, um, Greg, I really want to thank you. I thought your presentation was fabulous. Um, I'm so excited for the work that's going on in Trenton. And I suspect that people listening to you today do want to stay in touch with you. And we'll try to keep everybody connected together in our role at the Healthcare Value Hub. And as we always do. And we do, with all of you. Yes, and we also thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who um, sponsors the Healthcare Value Hub and help, lets us do our work. With that, Everyone, have a great afternoon. Have a great weekend. We're really, uh, thank you for joining us today. Greg, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you.